afternoon, everyone. My name is Ann Mason. I'm the Executive Director of the Plymouth Antiquarian Society. You're um, joining us for Sing Through History, which is our uh, special presentation um, and taking the place of our previously scheduled tour of Burial Hill. Normally on the first Saturday of the month, we present tours of Burial Hill in partnership with the Pilgrim Society and Pilgrim Hall Museum. And at this time, we cannot meet in person on top of Burial Hill, but we still wanted to share with you um, some of the local history contents that uh, we planned to share in that tour. So today's Sing Through History program will not really connect at all with um, anyone who's buried on Burial Hill. Um, we're taking a step away from the graveyard today um, and actually into the Antiquarian Society's archival collection. So all of the songs that I'll be sharing have a connection to our collection. And um, it's just a wonderful way to uh, learn about the music that connected Plymouthians at different periods. So just to let you know right from the beginning, this is not going to be um, a, a quick overview of every musical genre or every historical period um, in the Plymouth past. It's actually going to be a little bit of a, um, a, a, a jump from one thing to the next. Um, and I just uh, highlighted again things that had a representation in our collection, but this is by no means supposed to be the whole story. Um, so really what we'll be doing is, is catching a, a glimpse or hearing a single phrase um, from, from these different musical genres and musical periods. Um, but not seeing the, the complete picture or hearing the complete symphony, as it were. Um, so we're, we're going to start with the 18th century. And I'd like to start with a book in our, our, our Antiquarian Society's collection. This is the title page. And you can see that the book is the Psalms of David, imitated in the language of the New Testament and applied to the Christian state and worship by Isaac Watts. Now, um, before we start talking about the um, book itself and about Isaac Watts, I wanted to point out that we know who owned this book. And I think it's um, one of my favorite things in our collection. You can see at the top of the title page, there is a name. And on our next slide, I, I indeed um, highlighted that name so you can see it a little more clearly. Um, but this book belonged to Ephraim Spooner. And Ephraim is uh, shown here in one of the portraits that we have of him. He was the first Spooner to live in what we call the Spooner House Museum at 27 North Street in Plymouth. Um, he married into the house, so to speak. Uh, it had been left to his wife um, by her grandmother. Um, but he was a leading Plymouth citizen. He was a merchant. Uh, he was a prosperous merchant. And um, he was also the deacon of the church in Plymouth. And so what we have is his um, psalm book. And if you could imagine, it's, it's leather bound and it's about four inches by six inches. It has a very, very nice um, feel to it. It's very easy to hold it in your hand. Um, it's light, so it, it, doesn't, it doesn't feel like a burden at all. And I can imagine um, Ephraim using it in, in the church and, and being able to hold it and, um, and flip back and forth between the different texts. You'll note here on the bottom of the screen, I have a little image of a, uh, a, a just a little note that Ephraim uh, put into his book. Now he has these written all over um, the, the blank pages of this book. This one in, is written in ink. Most of them are actually written in pencil, so they're harder to read. But this one we can make out pretty well. And there's a date, January 3rd, 1808. There's a name, Mr. Kettle. And then there's a, a scripture reference, Romans 13th chapter, 11th verse. So I think what Ephraim was doing was actually keeping a record of the sermons that he heard. Now, I don't know if these were all the sermons. Uh, presumably they, they weren't all of them. That would be a lot of space to fill but perhaps they were the sermons that had special meaning to him. So he's recording the minister's name, the date of the sermon, and the, the text of the sermon. And um, so that's, that's something, again, very interesting to think about the um, spiritual life, religious life of residents of Plymouth. And part of that life was 
music. So let's take a look. As I said, this, um, this book is The Psalms of David by Isaac Watts. Now Isaac Watts was um, really probably the most uh, prolific English hymn writer of his um, generation. He um, published the Psalms of David first in 1719. And the edition that we have that Ephraim Spooner owned is actually the 45th edition, which was published in 1785 um, and printed in Boston. So this is a very, very popular book to have, and it was um, available widely throughout the English, um, throughout England and the English speaking colonies as well. Now, what Isaac Watts was trying to do was actually bring life to the Psalms. So in previous generations, um, church music was almost exclusively limited to singing the Psalms um, as they, they, had, they had been preserved, um, at least in terms of the tradition of, of men like John Calvin and other um, Protestant reformers. Um, and Isaac Watts didn't object to the hymn to the psalms at all um, but what he wanted to do is, is make them come to life to, to sort of take a step away from what he saw as more archaic language um, he actually said they ought to be translated in such a manner as we have reason to believe david would have composed them if he had lived in our day so a recognition that um uh, King David, who, who wrote many of the Psalms, would, would not have used the same language that he did when he wrote them if he were in 18th century um, England or America. And so um, Isaac Watts takes the Psalm texts and, and changes them. And what's interesting is that he often includes multiple versions of one Psalm. So I, I thought we'd look at Psalm 23, which is a, a Psalm that, that many of you may be familiar with, the Lord is my shepherd, that's usually how we think it begins. Um, but we actually have three versions of Psalm 23 and Ephraim Spooner's book. The first um, is labeled as long meter, and it's here, the text is here on the screen. And long meter, the, the meter of a, a hymn text is really just the pattern of the syllables. Um, and so long meter, would you would have four lines and there would be eight syllables in each line. So you could actually sit and count them if you wanted. My shepherd is the living Lord. Um, there's eight. Um, but that's the pattern that this text follows throughout. We also have a short meter version of Psalm 23 in the book. And with short meter, you switch from um, six syllables to eight syllables. So you have two lines of six, one line of eight, and then a final line of six. So that makes for a much shorter um, text. And then finally, we have a version of Psalm 23 in common meter. And so common meter was very frequently used. Um, and so it, it, it sort of mimicked the pattern of, of um, human speech in some ways. Um, and so it made for a very nice, um, a, a nice pattern to sing to. Um, and so we have eight syllables followed by six and then eight followed by six. So what tunes? Would these have been sung to? We have the different texts that Isaac Watts wrote. How would people know how to sing them? These are just words. Most um, books, psalm books, or hymn books in this period didn't have the music, the musical notations written right with the words, the texts. Um, and often you would know the tunes, you would learn the tunes, and um, you'd either commit them to memory or you'd, you'd be relying on the rest of the congregation. You might have a, um, a worship leader who originally would be lining out the hymns for the psalms to begin with, so that you would repeat sort of a call and response format. But in Ephraim Spooner's psalm book, we actually do have this appendix that was added. And you can see it's called A New Collection of Psalm Tunes Adapted to Congregational Worship. So we finally have these um, musical notations for different tunes that could be used with the text published in Isaac Watts book. Um, and they're, they're, awful, they're awful hard to read, especially if you need to um, either have memorized the words so that you could then come to the music and sing or memorize this tune and then go back to the music. Um, but I wanted to pull out two of them that we could try singing. Um, the first one I wanted to try is called Low Dutch. And you can see the CM means that it is common meter. 
So you could go and you could go through the text and pick any song, any text that had the CM after it and match it up to the tune that was CM. And as you can see in the image on the left, there's LM for long meter, and then at the bottom, SM for short meter. Now, low depth on the tune is sometimes also called Canterbury, and it has origins in the 16th century in England. Um, so this is an old tune that's continued to be used. And what I did is I took um, the tenor line, so that's the third line down on this um, piece of music, and that's the melody. But you can see there are three other parts that were supposed to be sung with the melody to make it a complete um, harmony. Um, so we'll switch over. I had to actually rewrite everything. I, I, uh, I wrote out the musical notation and added the words so it was easier for me to follow. Hopefully it will be easier for you to follow as well. And again, since you are um, at home, you don't have to worry about any of us hearing you while you sing. So I encourage you, I always think it's good to try singing and to um, certainly uh, sing as heartily as you can um, because you'll only learn if you make those mistakes and hear them as you go. Um, so here's Psalm 23 with the low Dutch tune. I pre-recorded it um, and it's not the greatest recording, but it will give you an idea of what it should sound like. Um, and just as a note on the recordings that I've made, I've often uh, altered the, um, uh, the, the key a little bit just to make them a little bit easier to sing. But I recognize that I, since I'm a soprano, um, it might not, not be super easy for you to follow along if you need to um, and you're a bass. Um, but this will just give you an idea. My shepherd will supply my need, Jehovah is his name. In pastures fresh he makes me feed beside the living stream. He brings my wandering spirit back when I forsake his ways and leads me for his mercy's sake in paths of truth and grace. So, I don't know if you sang along, <laughs> but that gives you again an idea of what that um, text would have um, sounded like one song with just one voice singing that melody part and without the harmony. Um, now what I wanted to do is actually hopefully um, give you a, a better feel for what congregational singing would have been because it would not have been, you know, it was not intended to be just, just one person um, singing that tune. Um, and so I found a wonderful um, setting of Psalm 23 using the low Dutch tune um, and using the words, the version of Psalm 23 that's found in the book, the Bay Book of Psalms, published here in Cambridge, Massachusetts in 1640. Um, so again, we have um, these very ancient tunes that are being used in very different ways throughout, you know, multiple, multiple generations, really. Um, and so, but this, what you might have noticed when I sang in my recording that the, the tune sounded a little bit um, stilted. It didn't really, it would, it, the way it was written, um, it, it didn't have a lot of um, interesting rhythm <laughs> to it. Um, so it was very straight. Um, but what you'll see in the adaptation that I'm going to play for you now, um, they use that same basic tune, but they make it more interesting. And I think uh, with the harmony, it's, it's a much um, more, it's a, a lovely piece. So here, let's listen to this.
a great fan of choral singing and um, it's been very hard to not be able to sing with other people in person in recent months. So um, it's, I, I just love, I love hearing the voices. Um, so that was the low Dutch tune, two different versions of it. And we can see how we have um, Isaac Watts uh, text being used to fit uh, one meter. Um, and here in Ephraim Spooner's um, book, we have another tune that will probably be very familiar to some of you. And I saw it and I said, well, we have to try singing this. And it is um, Chester. So you'll note here um, at the top of this image that we have the small letter F, which is the um, taking the place of, of, of what we would use a letter S for, but that is supposed to be Chester, not Chefter. Um, but Chester here is a, a tune that is um, fit for long meter. Um, so you can use any of the long meter texts to, um, to sing with it. And again, like uh, Low Dutch, we have uh, four parts that can sing. Um, and this is actually a longer tune. So you actually have two lines of music to sing. Um, once again, the tune is in the tenor line. Um, and let's um, go ahead and uh, listen to it. And then we'll talk a little bit about where this tune came from. My shepherd is the living Lord. Now shall my wants be well supplied. His brother dance and holy word become my safety and my guide. Well, as you can see, um, I've added a note here that the composer of Chester is William Billings. And Chester is uh, one of the, the sort of probably, probably one of the most popular songs that was sung during the American Revolution. I have no idea if um, Ephraim Spooner ever sang the text to Psalm 23 to it because um, he was a patriot. And so I'm sure he would have known the tune Chester and um, I'm sure he would have so associated it with very different lyrics. Um, patriotic lyrics, um, which we're going to hear next. But William Billings was one of the earliest um, truly American composers. So a lot of the uh, American music in the colonial period is, of course, pulling on um, traditions from, from England and elsewhere in Europe. Um, but you start seeing in the 18th century sort of the American grown um, composers who, who start to develop an American flavor to um, their compositions. Um, and so the tune Chester was first published in the Singing Master's Assistant in 1778 um, by William Billings. And um, just as a note, tune names in this period were often named for places. Um, so uh, it, it was considered a way to differentiate between tunes if you knew, oh, that's, that's the Portsmouth tune or the Boston tune or the Philadelphia tune. Um, so that's often the, the tunes themselves aren't associated with those places, though. Um, they're just used as a, as, a, as a way to title them. So let's go ahead and listen to um, a professional group <laughs> sing the, the lyrics that you're probably more familiar with for the tune Chester. And again, this is the great patriotic tune of the American Revolution.
sure. And I'm curious how many of you actually um, are familiar with it. I know that um, Dr. Walter Powell is um, participating in the webinar today, and he's providing a lot of great notes in the chats um, uh, feature, so you can certainly read through those um, about Billings. Um, and uh, Walt just, just noted that Billings was, was probably widely sung in Plymouth and almost certainly by younger people in singing schools. And certainly, I think we can tell that that tune would have been uh, really easy to sing. It does, it's, it's very hearty and robust and it um, puts you in the spirit for great patriotic work, I think. Um, so I, it, it really captures, I think, the feeling of the 18th century. Um, but again, hopefully what you can see from this short dive into Ephraim Spooner's um, songbook, that um, uh, 18th century music ha had a great flexibility and diversity. So you could use different tunes and pair them with different texts that maybe, um, you know, you wouldn't normally do. And, and probably you could do that based on uh, what you were interested in conveying, um, particularly perhaps during congregational worship. Um, there might be a tune that was more appropriate if, if you're choosing a text that's um, of a more somber note, um, or you could cho choose a psalm that's very joyful and you would want to have uh, a joyful uh, tune that you could sing um, to it. Um, so I do have a question open here. Someone has asked, do you know if women would have ever led a 17th century congregation in singing, particularly if they were responding with the lining method or would it have always have been a deep, deeper male voice to lead? Um, I would think that it would exclusively be a male voice, um, and that would uh, most likely be because of um, sort of beliefs about um, women's place within the worship service. Um, so again, I'll, I'll, I'd be happy to have um, someone else who's on the on the webinar um, pop up a thought in the chat if you have another view. Um, but I certainly don't think in uh, 17th century Plymouth, you'd have a woman lining out, um, out psalms for the congregation. Um, I imagine that uh, you would see more of that uh, female leadership um, when you, in, in Quaker congregations, for example. Um, so that's, that's a great question. Um, and again, we'll keep, I'll keep my eye on that chat box in case um, anyone has any more information on it. Okay, so let's see, let's move on. I'm not seeing any other questions um, right now in the Q&A. So um, we're going to move on from Ephraim Spooner, but we're not going to go very far. Now this is our next um, piece of music to look at, and I'm sure you're saying, and this is not a piece of music, this is a needlework sampler. And um, you're right, it is. <laughs> but there's a text that can be sung on this sampler. Now, this is the, um, the, uh, the sampler done in 1782 by Sarah Spooner, which is part of the Antiquarian Society's collection. And Sarah was usually known as Sally, and she was the daughter of Ephraim Spooner. So we just looked at Ephraim's songbook. Sarah is his daughter. He and his wife, Elizabeth Shirtliff, um, had nine children, but only four of them lived to adulthood. And Sarah or Sally was their only surviving daughter. She was born in 1772, um, and she never actually married. So um, when her father died in 1818, her mother actually also died in 1818, um, and the family home at 27 North Street was split um, between her three brothers, Thomas, James, and Ebenezer. They inherited the house um, but Sally continued to live there, and um, she died in 1855. Um, so she completed the sampler in 1782 when she was just um, nine years old. And samplers uh, were a way for upper and middle class family, um, girls in upper and middle class families to be trained in the art of needlework. It was certainly important to practice your needlework skills in this period because it was a domestic skill that would come in handy. Um, but it was also a skill that could be used to create a decorative showpiece for the family. So this, this is certainly a decorative showpiece. It does show that she um, knows her alphabet, she knows her numbers, um, and she knows some beautiful stitches. Um, so it's one of my um, favorite needlework pieces that we have in our collection. But what I want to draw your attention to 
is the verse on this sampler. Now, I know it's hard to read because um, the green thread is very light and has faded somewhat, so it's, it's not as easy to read as perhaps it was originally. But I've copied here the words um, that uh, are here on the sampler. In books or works are healthful play, let my first years be passed, that I may give for every day some good account at last. And this is a verse from a song by our old friend, Isaac Watts. And so I think actually, um, Walt may have, um, have noted this in the chat that Isaac Watts um, did write texts that were, that were used across many generations. So just as song tunes might be passed down and reused, um, texts could be as well. Um, and so here we have an 18th century sampler with uh, the words of Isaac Watts. And these same words were used um, in a book that was published in 1863. Now the text um, on the sampler was actually from um, a book that Isaac Watts published called Divine and Moral Songs for Children, um, first published in 1715. So he published it in 1715. It would have already been rather old. We might think, oh, it must have been outdated by the time Sally Spooner did her sampler. Um, in 1782, but not the case. Um, girls were still, girls and boys were still using Isaac Watts' um, divine and moral songs. And the poem itself is what we might call a moralistic poem. It's a poem that has a moral at the end of it or a lesson you're supposed to learn. Um, and it begins, and I'm going to switch to the next slide so you can see, the first verse is actually about a bee. How doth the bee, the little busy bee, improve each shining hour and gather honey all the day from every opening flower. Um, and the, the text goes on to talk about the work of the bee. Um, and as we saw on um, Sally's sampler, the moral is that um, you want to make sure just like the bee, you're, you're, you're busy. You want to be industrious. Um, the bee is a model of hard work and hard work and in industry is encouraged um, from an early generation, from an early age in this period in the 18th century when Sally was a little girl um, and into the 19th century, as we can see um, from this um, 19th century uh, hymn or song. It's more of a song than a hymn, I think. Um, but we do have the text being published in children's songs books for later generations. This one, as I, I just earlier showed you, I'll pop back to that slide. Um, this one is the Cherub, um, and it's a collection of songs for Sabbath schools and Sabbath evenings, published in Boston in 1863. Um, most, a lot of the texts are from earlier um, uh, writers, um, but most of the tunes were composed by J.C. Johnson, and he also added some of his own texts as well. So this uh, tiny book is not in the Antiquarian Society's collection, but I wanted to draw from it just so we'd have a chance to hear um, the Busy Bee uh, sung. So again, let me play my recording of the first verse. How doth the bee, the little busy bee, improve each shining hour, and gather honey all the day from every opening flower? How doth the little busy bee improve each shining hour, and gather honey all the day from every opening flower, and gather honey all the day from every opening flower. So again, although Sally Spooner would not have been alive to hear that tune, um, set to that, or hear that text set to that tune, I think we can imagine um, other school children, um, uh, or, or, you know, children going to Sabbath school, who are um, singing that? It's, it's again a very catchy, bouncy tune um, that you could that you could easily learn the message, the lesson from the poem by memorizing the tune. And um, in fact, that this text by um, Isaac Watts was so so prevalent and used, um, you know, to teach children um, this moral lesson of hard work. Um, that it was even parodied. And so you may have thought, oh my, how doth the little busy bee? That sounds very familiar, but, but not, not quite, not quite right. Well, this is the version of how doth the little busy bee that Lewis Carroll includes in Alice in Wonderland, which is published in 1865. Um, and this, to set the scene for you, 
um, Alice, uh, who is of course a very curious little girl, um, is starting to have all sorts of strange adventures as she follows the, the rabbit. Um, and she actually, in chapter two of the book, sits down and says to herself, oh dear, what is happening to me? Um, and she says, well, you know, maybe I'm not who I who I was before. Maybe I've turned into another little girl. And she thinks, well, I need to see um, if I'm the same person. So she says, I'll try if I know all the things I used to know. I'll try and say, how doth the little? And she crossed her hands on her lap as if she were saying lessons and began to repeat it. But her voice sounded hoarse and strange and the words did not come the same as they used to do. And these are the words that she says. How doth the little crocodile improve his shining tail and pour the waters of the Nile on every golden scale. How cheerfully he seems to grin, how neatly spreads his claws and welcomes little fishes in with gently smiling jaws. Now that's quite a ways, quite a distance from the Isaac Watts test text. There's no um, mention of a bee and certainly that moral of, of being industrious and, and working hard is completely gone. In fact, in its place we have a little bit of nonsense um, about a crocodile, but also it's, it's a little bit um, ominous, this idea of a, of a crocodile being able to practice his grin um, so that he can more, um, more easily ensnare the little fish that are swimming into his mouth. Um, so actually what happens after this scene in Alice in Wonderland, um, Alice finds herself shrinking um, and she finds herself swimming in her own tears, um, which she had shed when she was nine feet high. So um, that's, the, that's one of the scenes from the earlier chapters of Alice in Wonderland. So we have, um, we have an, an 18th century, an early 18th century Isaac Watt, Watts text that gets used on a later 18th century sampler that gets um, um, paired with a, a mid 19th century tune for a cassava school and then gets parodied in a mid 19th century um, children's novel. Um, so we, we've covered quite a bit of ground, I think. Um, I'm just gonna pause and see if we have any questions. Oh, we do have some questions. Okay. Um, Oh, great. So Walt um, actually responded in his um, in the in the Q&A and said he agrees, as I thought, women were excluded from being presenters at this time. So, right. I don't think that I would have I would have been very surprised if that if we had any record of, of that happening. Um, so thank you, Walt, for that. Um, all right. Let me see. How are we doing? OK. All right, so um, let, uh, let's move now into the 19th century. And in the 19th century, well, we already sort of were in the 19th century looking at um, that 1863 children's song. Um, but I want to look at some sheet music in the Antiquarian Society's archival collection. This um, piece of music, we actually don't have an, an origin for. So we, we don't know who owned it or how it entered the collection. Um, but it is, it is um, a, a very interesting song. As you can see, it's called Woodman Spare That Tree, a ballad. Um, and we have the names of the authors here on the title page. Um, so it was, it was based on a poem by uh, George Pope Morris, who first published it in the New York Mirror Magazine in 1830. So George Morris writes the poem. And then in 1837, Henry Russell um, sets it to music and publishes this ballad. Now, Henry Russell was, was an English um, musician and he was, he was a singer, a pianist, a composer. And he, was actually, he actually came to the United States on several tours. So um, we're in the 1830s, 1840s, and we have musicians who are, are, are touring the country and providing concerts. Um, to, to the public, and you have the rise of sort of a, a new style of popular music. Um, at the same time, you have um, 
more people, more families, perhaps being able to afford having um, some kind of piano or instrument within their own home in the, the, the middle classes. Um, you have the, the expansion of production um, and you have the expansion of, of commercial popular songs. So there's an abundance of sheet music, not as much as we'll see in um, later years, but certainly um, people have the ability to um, bring, bring, buy music and bring it home and sing it at home. And so some of these songs are actually part of um, what we might call parlor culture. Um, so, you know, in-home entertainment before there are movies or television or radio or any kind of recorded music. Um, you have to make your own music. Um, and so we're moving out of the, the realm of uh, religious song now and moving into this realm of popular commercial music. Um, often those, um, those commercial songs, popular songs were very sentimental in this period, um, but there were many that were also um, written for reform purposes to try to move, move along different um, reform movements. Um, so let me uh, play for you Woodman Spare That Tree. You'll see the first page is all piano music. <laughs> and then the second page comes in um, where, again, if you want, you can sing along. Um, I am not singing this this time. This is actually um, was recorded by Professor Derek B. Scott, who is professor of critical musicology at the University of Leeds. Um, and so he recorded his own version of the song. Oh 
my heart strings around the cling close as thy bark old friend here shall the wild bird sing and still thy branches bend old tree sentimental feelings you might have in terms of um, a, an, an old tree that your forefathers planted that you um, you know don't want to see cut down as opposed to being you know a song for for conservation or, or early inventor environmentalism um, but now we're going to look at a song that is certainly a song of reform a song that has a call to action um, and it's it's similar in in style in some ways, but the content is very, very different. Um, so this is, as you can see on the screen, this is a piece of music called The Bereaved Slave Mother. And um, it was published in 1844. Now, you can actually see here on um, this, the slide that the brief, this copy of The Bereaved Slave Mother was owned by Annie B. Stevens. Her name is written in pencil on it. Um, and she uh, was the, the, the daughter and granddaughter of Plymouth abolitionists. Um, so she was the daughter of Lemuel Stevens and Anne Maria Buckminster. And her grandparents were the elder Lemuel Stevens and his wife, Sarah or Sally Morton. Um, and the, her grandparents were some of the earliest abolitionists in Plymouth and some of the most um, active. Um, they worked closely with, um, you know, the Stevens families worked with the Harlow family and the Spooner's fam Spooner family um, to try to achieve the abolition of slavery, um, which was not even in the North. It was not always a popular idea. Um, certainly in, in the 1830s, 1840s, uh, into, the, into the 1850s, they received a lot of criticism and pushback for agitating for abolition. Um, and you can see I did, since normally we'd be on Burial Hill and looking at gravestones, I did add a photograph of um, Annie B. Stevens' grave. Um, so she lived into the 20th century and she is buried in Oak Grove Cemetery. She was born in 1848, so by the time she was um, a young young teen, um, she would it would the Civil War would have already really been um, been going on. So um, she was not an active abolitionist um, in uh, when the song was was written because she was uh, quite young, <laughs> but um, she would have certainly have probably heard it sung by her. Um, her grandparents or her parents. Um, so let's look again a little uh, more closely at this song. You can see that it's it was composed and sung by the Hutchinsons. Now we believe that it was composed by Jesse Hutchinson. So the Hutchinsons were um, one of these American family singing groups that toured the country. Initially it was three brothers um, from New Hampshire and then their fourth brother Jesse joined them. They were some of the most popular entertainers of the 1840s and Jesse in particular um, wrote um, lyrics that confronted social issues. So issues like um, uh, the abuse of alcohol, so um, songs in support of temperance, um, as well as anti-slavery. Um, and they, they sang, in fact, at an anti-slavery rally in Boston that drew a crowd of 20,000 people. Um, so these were songs that were, um, you know, you, being used not just for entertainment, or really not for entertainment at all. They were songs that be, were being used to move people to action and to bring people together to support the cause of abolition. 
You can also see that the song is dedicated to Lydia Mariah Child, um, who was a leading American abolitionist. She had been born in 1802 in Medford, Massachusetts. Um, and in the 1840s, she um, was editing the National Anti-Slavery Standard. She was a writer, an editor, very well known um, supporter of abolition um, and leader um, also of, of women's suffrage and women's rights. So let's take a closer look. Um, I think what's um, what what I what I you know it's 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 really a horrific print here on the, this cover for this music. Um, it depicts what the song, um, the story of the song will tell. Um, in the center of the image, you have an auctioneer um, selling a child on the auction block um, and and uh, raising her hands in plea. Uh, a, a desperate plea that, that her child not be taken fr taken from her is this enslaved um, African woman, um, and you can see that there are you know there there are people crowded around the auction, obviously people bidding on the child, um, but also what looks like bystanders who um, don't seem terribly concerned about what's happening, um, and so one one you know this is a terribly horrific image, I think, especially um, from, from our perspective here in the 21st century, it should be horrific. Um, but it would have been horrific to the abolitionists as well. Um, and I think what they would have found most disturbing was the indifference of the people here in the crowd. Um, and one of the, the, you know, the things that abolitionists were trying to accomplish was to make people see um, that enslaved people were not property, that they were people. Um, and so I've put up here also from the Antiquarian Society's collection, um, one of the most common symbols in the abolition movement. Um, there's one, there's a matching one that says, am I not a man and a brother? And this one says, am I not a woman and a sister? So the question is, are we looking at um, people, slaves, are we looking at them as people, as women and sisters, as mothers, um, or are we, are we looking at them um, as property? Um, and so this, this song is, is very powerfully trying to, um, you know, to bring those emotions to, to the fore. Now, what I've done is these are the interior pages. So there are quite a number of verses. You actually have, um, you know, it's a very short um, song. It's, the tune is, is, is quite short, but there are eight different verses that tell this, this story. Um, describing the, the sale of the child and then ending with this cry um, for people to um, step up and to, to rescue um, those, those who are in slavery. Um, so I did not sing all eight verses. I sang the four verses that I've typed up here on the screen for you. Um, so I will play that now. Oh, deep was the anguish of the slave mother's heart when called from her darling forever to part so grieved that lone mother that heart-broken mother in sorrow and woe the lash of the master her deep sorrows mock while the child of her bosom is sold on the block, yet loud shrieked that mother, poor heart broken mother, in sorrow and woe. The harsh auctioneer to sympathy cold tears the babe from its mother and sells it for gold, while the infant and mother loud shriek for each other in sorrow and woe. O oh, list ye kind mothers to the cries of the slave, the parents and children implore you to save. Go rescue the mothers, the sisters and brothers from sorrow and woe. Now, I think we can all probably agree that the human voice is, is one of the most powerful instruments in the world. And um, certainly there are many occasions where music has been used to rally people to a cause, to expose injustice um, and to seek a solution. Um, so we, we've seen quite a span in terms of the types of music that people in Plymouth knew and sang. 
Um, and it indeed, um, we, we have a tune here that even though the content is dark, um, the tune itself is rather easy to sing. Um, it would be easy to learn. And um, it's actually an Irish tune. So if it sounded familiar, it's a tune called Kathleen O'More. Um, so there are other, there are a lot of different traditional Irish versions of this song that you can hear. Um, uh, so, so it's interesting that the Hutchinson family is taking the, um, you know, this, this Irish song and using it for um, this particular text. So um, we're going to move on. I don't see that there are any questions. Um, but we will move on to the 20th century. And um, this is the last thing from our collection that I wanted to look at. And, and we're, we're again, moving ahead in time and sort of jumping to a completely different emotional place. Um, I wanted to talk a little bit just about the mechanization of music. So when um, you know, we, we see the commercialization of music and the growth of the commercial popular music um, and performers who go out and travel the country. Um, and in the 20th century, of course, we have um, music available um, through, through recorded formats. So we have um, radios in the house. Um, we have records that people can play. Um, and this is a book, a notebook, kept by a woman named Elizabeth Jackson, or excuse me, Elizabeth Snow Jackson. Um, she was born in 1918, and she lived in Carver, Massachusetts, so right next to Plymouth, of course. Um, her father was George F. Snow, who owned many cranberry bogs um, around um, Wenham Pond in Carver. But um, Elizabeth Snow Jackson became a life member of the Plymouth Antiquarian Society in 1969. Um, and it, eventually when she passed away in 1998, um, a lot of her family papers came to our archival collection. Um, and I absolutely love this, this little notebook. Um, you can see it's titled Radio Book. It doesn't have a cover, um, but it's just, you know, your ordinary composition book. Um, but Elizabeth has listed all of the stations um, and the cities um, that she, she presumably was able to dial into and to hear. Uh, on other pages of the notebook, she includes um, photographs that she's clipped out of the newspaper of radio announcers and of popular singers. Um, and she also recorded, rewrote, wrote out some of her um, favorite song lyrics. So this is certainly something that I did when I when I was a girl. Um, Elizabeth was born in 1918, so by the 1930s, you know, she's a, a young woman. Um, and uh, here is one of her favorite songs, which I just thought would be um, fun to sing as sort of a, a, a penultimate song for us to, to um, wrap up with here. Um, this song was published in 1935. Um, and we're going to actually hear the one of the earliest recordings by Ruth Edding. Life is a song, let's sing it together. Let's take our hearts and dip them in rhyme. Let's learn the music together, hoping the song lasts for a long, long time. Life is a song that goes on forever, love's old refrain can never go Strike the note, Mendelssohn wrote, concerning spring weather. Let's sing it together and make life a song. Don't be afraid of the future, all of our plans will come true. How can they fail? With love on our side, they'll never fail. We won't be denied. All 
the world a symphony for you, for me. Life is a song. Let's sing it together. Oh, let's take our hearts and dip them in rhyme. Let's learn the words. Let's learn the music together, hoping the song lasts for a long, long time. Our life is a song that goes on forever. Love's old refrain can never go wrong. Strike the note, Mendelssohn wrote, concerning spring weather. Ah, oh, let's sing it together and make life a song. So I know those lyrics might seem a little trite, especially compared to what we just looked at from the 19th century. But I certainly think um, it's meaningful if we're trying to understand the people who lived in the past and trying to understand local history. Um, it's meaningful to see what songs um, people chose to write down and remember. I know that, um, you know, we certainly in my life, there have been songs that they don't seem like much, but then when um, you know, I hear them, they take me right back to 10 years ago and to a, a special moment in my life. Um, um, and so music can transport us to a very different place. It can express our, our emotions, whether that's joy or sadness. Um, and it, it's, a, it's a wonderful gift to have. Um, I did want to share that in the one of the lines here is let's strike the note Mendelssohn wrote concerning spring weather. And I think that's an allusion um, to Felix Mendelssohn's um, Songs Without Words, which are were a set of short piano pieces written between 1829 and 1845 by um, Felix Mendelssohn. Um, and he did have one called Spring Song, which I'm sure you all know or have heard of. So I'll just play it so you can hear it just a little bit. taste of Mendelssohn for today. Um, certainly, I think you can get a sense of um, maybe some of the, the elements of that song that were being picked up in the um, popular 1930s song that we just heard. Um, so that's the end of our program. We've, we've jumped around quite a bit, as I told you we would. We've um, gone from the 18th century, the 19th century, the 20th century. We've uh, looked at all sorts of different genres and types of music and types of texts. Um, Thank you for singing today and, and for sharing your comments and your feedback. Um, I do have here my email address and our website um, because for sure, um, feel free to send questions or follow up comments or um, just feel free to connect to the Antiquarian Society. And I would say that we are having, um, hopefully having some kind of alternative to our July Burial Hill Tour. Um, Dr. Donna Curtin, Executive Director of the Pilgrim Society and Pilgrim Hall Museum should be um, uh, she's, she's on the schedule to speak on um, the revolution in Plymouth. Um, now, the first Saturday in July is actually July 4th, so we're going to have to see what will work um, in terms of, of a presentation then, but do um, stay tuned in for that. Um, and finally, I would be very remiss if I didn't say anything about um, the 76th anniversary of D-Day, today, June 6, 1944 the invasion of Normandy. And um, I thought that as you all depart, if you'd like to sing along, you can. But one of my favorite songs, even though I don't think we have a copy of it in the PAS archives, one of my favorite songs is We'll Meet Again by Vera Lynn, who is actually still alive. She's 103 this year. Um, and this is just such a fabulous um, song 
um, certainly re reminds you of um, the feelings of the World War II generation, but I think as we're still separated from each other because of coronavirus, um, hopefully this song will remind you to stay encouraged and to hold on to that belief that we will meet again, um, hopefully before too long. So I'm gonna start playing that now. again don't know where don't know when but i know we'll meet again some sunny day keep smiling through just like you always do skies drive the dark clouds far away so will you please say hello to the folks that I know tell them I won't be long they'll be happy to know that as you saw me go I was singing this song again don't know where don't know when but i know we'll meet again some sunny day 